Perhaps we can pray this evening as our offertory prayer that God would once again bring healing to our nation. Amen. Amen. That the voices that are doing and the powers that are at work to bring division and to separate us and to instigate hate and dissatisfaction, they will fail in their mission. Wouldn't that be good? Amen. The church has a role to play in this, folks. And it's going to require a different kind of courage than we've been accustomed to demonstrating. But I believe God will help us. We'll have to have a commitment where we want to please God more than we want the approval of our culture. Amen. And God can give us that. Amen. So it's our offertory prayer. You know, we've, some of you are guests or visiting. When COVID, we changed some of our patterns. One of those was passing an offering plate. And your willingness to adapt and to learn new ways to give has made that possible. But your generosity makes church possible. So I thank you for that. If you're joining us from at home, put your pizza down. We're about to pray. <laughs> you know, prayer isn't just our words. It's an attitude of respect for the Lord. It's why we close our eyes. It's why we bow our heads or we fold our hands. All of those are expressions of humility and submission. And we're about to approach the throne of the creator of heaven and earth. So it's worth closing our eyes or bowing our head. or um, It's the greatest honor of our lives. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the reminder tonight, or the visual reminder, of those who have made great sacrifices on our behalf. Lord, many have given their lives. They've stood against public opinion. They've stood up against hatred and bigotry and injustice. Father, we have inherited tremendous freedoms and liberties and opportunities of a magnitude, Father, that no generation has ever known. I pray that we would recognize what we have received and we would use that to build unity and hope and a purpose for our children and grandchildren. Father, awaken your people that what unites us is our faith in you, not our appearance or our accent or the region of the country where we live or the political party that we might endorse, but that we stand united under the authority of the name of Jesus. And may his name once again be exalted in this nation, from the smallest community to the largest cities. I thank you for it. Forgive us, Father. We have been silent. Well, there has been a coordinated effort to remove you, but you have awakened us and give us now boldness and courage and a determination to be ambassadors for your kingdom. May Jesus' name be exalted from coast to coast and border to border. May your people be strengthened throughout the earth. We thank you for the heritage of faith we have, and may we have the courage to extend it to the next generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat. It's good to have Mac Brock with us this weekend. Thank God. He is always such a blessing. I know he was in the announcement loop a little earlier, but I would add a reminder. I have a good friend from Israel who will be visiting us in a few days. He'll be arriving, I think, a week from tomorrow, but beginning a week from Monday, Monday through Thursday of that week, Ronnie Simone will be here. He'll be doing a seminar in the mornings from 9 to about 11.30. There's two sessions each morning. He has eight presentations on the history of Jerusalem. He's as qualified to do that as anybody I know. Of all the places I have studied in the world, and I've had the privilege of studying in some good places, Ronnie's understanding of the history of the Middle East, and particularly of Jerusalem, is really unparalleled. So if your schedule permits, I would encourage you to be here. We will not live stream it, but it will be available after the fact. So, and then the Wednesday night of that week, Ronnie and I will be doing a discussion about what's happening in the Middle East. So, Mostly Ronnie will be doing the discussion. I'll just be introducing him. <laughs> but I'll probably interject a question or two if I don't understand. So, but if your schedule permits you, I would encourage you to be a part. Ronnie, was, uh, he's retired now, but he was a lieutenant colonel in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. His, his parents immigrated to Israel from Romania when Ronnie was a, a small boy. 
So he certainly understands the circumstances that are happening there and is well prepared to help give us some perspective. So I hope you'll be able to be with us. Anybody's welcome. That'll take place here in Three Crosses Sanctuary. All right. You should have an outline. Aren't you glad we're indoors tonight? Huh? If we had to be, we'd do church outside. But I'm glad we don't have to be. God is good to us. You know, don't take the blessings of the Lord for granted. We have so much. We have so much food and so many clothing and so many options and so much stuff. And it's easy to get grumpy. Don't be grumpy. Well, it's not going the way I want. No kidding. Part of the reason we have as many struggles as we do is we got so much. We got more to do than we can get to. We've got more stuff than we've got room for. Our kids have so many options, they get grumpy. Just try on a little gratitude. Like purposefully, intentionally, walk through a whole day. So like, today I am going to be thankful. I'll be thankful for the car in front of me that's driving too slow. I'll be thank you for a traffic light that is not changing. I'll be thank you for work I didn't want to do. I'll be thankful today. Take one day, lean into it. And watch what the Lord will do for you. I'll take those two amens as an overwhelming <laughs> affirmation of the idea. The rest of you take it under advisement. I want to start a new study with you. Uh, this session we're going to talk about let's choose truth. I know you know enough English on this one. Let's is just a contraction, two words, let us. It's an interesting uh, study. We're going to do a bit of it together. I don't know how much we will do, but some things the Bible instructs us to do corporately, collectively. And one of the instructions we're given is that to let us choose truth. We've learned a little bit. We'd, we've learned that let us pray. We've done let's pray and let's read and let's talk. And we're going to add some things to our portfolio. But I want to start this little journey with this notion of the significance, the importance, biblically, of choosing the truth, holding the truth in high esteem, valuing it, recognize how important it is to be in a place where the truth is told. We'll start with Proverbs 23. It says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. Pretty straightforward verse. Buy the truth, don't sell it. The, the simplest observation is that there is a cost to the truth. You know that intuitively if you haven't really even thought about it consciously. There are times the truth in your life, if you are a person of truth, or you stand with the truth, will come with a cost. The biblical counsel we're given is buy the truth, pay the price. Buy the truth. We become a nation of deception. Oh, we have fancy words. We call it spin or marketing or PR. No, I didn't say all marketing's a lie or all PR is deceptive. We call it speaking evangelistically. Unfortunately, we even have religious words that have become code for lying. We have lost trust and faith in so many places that once upon a time we imagined to be trustworthy. And it's because we've recognized that they are no longer arbiters of the truth. We, we've chosen the convenient, what gets us to the objective most quickly, what enables us to get our way, what we think will give us an advantage. So in all of those arenas, we will sacrifice the truth. We call it a competitive advantage. Everybody does it. No, everybody doesn't. And if, even if everybody is doing it, You'd be better not to participate so that Almighty God might bring his best to you. Amen. Buy the truth and don't sell it. Secure the truth, don't release it. And then we're given the outcome. Hebrew poetry is often written in couplets, two ideas put together, and to get the full meaning, you, you need both halves. The beginning of this is buy the truth and don't sell it. And then it says get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. Derive from the truth... Derived from that decision, you will begin to accumulate wisdom, discipline, understanding. Wisdom is the best use of knowledge. You can know a lot of things, but not have the wisdom to do the right thing with it. 
We've all known some of those people. Discipline is the essential component of being a disciple. You cannot be Jesus' disciple without discipline. You cannot. It's impossible. Linguistically, it shows us that. And discipline, by definition, means that we will engage repeatedly, consistently, as a matter of habit in things that may not be pleasant, things that will require perseverance, endurance, could be sacrificial. Discipline at almost any level will put you in a minority position. Discipline is not fashionable these days. And then we're told that if we buy the truth, it'll bring understanding. Understanding is insight, it's revelation. It's not just information, it's beyond that. It's an awareness of outcomes, consequences, benefits. A person of understanding. Understanding can come many ways, but one of the ways it comes to us is God gives it to us. He grants us understanding. Imagine the creator of heaven and earth giving to you or to me understanding. That's the point of the book of Proverbs. Let's go back to that first phrase, buy the truth and don't sell it. Question, important question, what resources are you currently investing in buying the truth? Do you give time to it? I mean valuable time, not leftover time, irrelevant time, time you were going to waste anyway. What resources are you currently investing in securing the truth for yourself and your family? It's very important. I brought you a passage from Matthew. It's, it's two very short parables that Jesus gave us that speaks to this point. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then he, in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and he bought the field. He found something so valuable that he would liquidate so he could secure what this thing was that he had found. Same idea, a little different story. Again, this is Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had. And he bought it. It's this principle that there are some things of such significance, such great value, that anything we might accumulate in time pales in significance to what those things are. Jesus described it as the kingdom of God. He said, there isn't anything on this planet that we could currently secure that would be of more value to us than the principles of the kingdom of God. In Proverbs, it said it just a little more directly, a little more plainly, buy the truth, don't sell it. So I'm going to suggest to you, I mean, we've been working together for a few weeks to put together some principles, some ideas, and some practices that will bring spiritual momentum to us in this year. A year that I believe is going to be earmarked by disruption and some attempts to create confusion. And I believe it will require of the church some wisdom. And we'll have to understand our source of truth. So we've been trying to put some ideas and principles and patterns in place to strengthen us so that we could leave, lead a triumphant life this year. And I believe this one is essential. Let's choose the truth. Let's decide, even if it's uncomfortable. See, this notion that the truth is always fun or encouraging or hopeful, baloney. I was in school long enough, not every truthful response I got to a project or a test or a paper was encouraging. In fact, I thought for a while I was sub, sub, keeping the supply of red ink <laughs> underwritten with my own personal academic career. If you're old enough to have been to the doctor for something more than an athletic physical for high school, you probably received some news that wasn't encouraging. It may have been nothing more than you're too fluffy. <laughs> Actually, I'm the perfect weight. I'm just a little short. <laughs> if I was about 7'4", I'd be ideal. The truth is valuable. It enables you to make the necessary course adjustments to get to better outcomes. Let's choose God's truth. I gave you a little paradigm some time back. I asked you to begin to watch and listen, remember that? To think that we were living in a time of confusion and a lot of deception and many things. And the, the encouragement was to watch, to listen, to think, and to act. To not just be a spectator. 
Well, I think that's a helpful tool for the season that we have entered into. I was reflecting on that a little bit. I was looking back through some notes. It was 2020. I have several places where we began as a community of faith to pray that the truth would be made evident. It, wasn't, it was about this time, four years ago, a couple weeks from now, that we got plunged into a global crisis. And there was so much which was hidden or unknown from us as that began to unfold. We were left to make decisions with just a, a bare minimum of information and insight. We were being told what to do, but the background for it was not obvious, and they were free speech was under assault, and if you didn't agree with the, the public line, there were very few ways to communicate those things. Well, you know, to my frustration, we prayed for truth, and the answers did not arrive the day we prayed. Don't you hate that? <laughs> Have you ever asked God to do something? And I meant, like, now. Yeah. I wasn't praying for tomorrow. But when we prayed that God would let us know the truth, I believe he's answered those prayers, but he didn't do it the day we prayed. But in the intervening months, God has brought so much to the light that was hidden. And I think it's worth just a moment's reflection. I believe it will give us hope for what is ahead of us. Not that the truth we see is always a great victory, but when you don't know the truth, you are, you are victim to what's happening in the darkness. The value of the light is to help you see what's happening in the darkness. And we've been called to be light. So that's the reason our choosing the truth is so important. I mentioned COVID. We could start there. It was about four years ago now. You know, we weren't, you couldn't really say in public anything about Wuhan. If I said Wuhan online, and if you mentioned a lab in Wuhan, yeah, you were a xenophobic, bad human being. And then we started to hear about following the science. And I'm a complete advocate for that. I want to be on the record. I'm an advocate for science. But, but not all science, not everything that goes under the label science is good. Like not everything that goes under the guise of faith is good. And we were introduced to some junk science. It wasn't abundantly clear at the time. We knew we were facing a great threat. We were told that by every possible outlet that was available. But even Dr. Fauci has admittedly recently acknowledged that that six-foot thing about social distancing, that really wasn't grounded in science. Just an idea. We know at this point that bandanas and a flimsy paper mask will not protect you from a virus. Who knew? I thought I was playing Roy Rogers again. It worked for me. We understood that quarantining healthy people is not a great idea. That sending our children home from school does not really facilitate their learning. We learned that pharmaceutical companies were making enormous profits from a global pandemic and that they were refusing to give any significant consideration to available medicines. It would have diminished their profit, but could have possibly helped people. But it wasn't just COVID where we've had a, a great deal of truth revealed. I believe since, 19, since 2020, the moral decay and depravity around us has become far more clear to us. The determination to redefine institutions that have shaped our culture and our civilization, things like marriage. There is a determined effort underway to confuse things as fundamental as our biological sex. Even more troubling is the targets that we have seen that have been placed on our children. It wasn't nearly as apparent in 2020. Today, it's far more clear. I'm certain that all the truth is not yet into the public arena, but it's much more clear than it was. Pedophilia, the abuse of children, the trafficking of children, the sexualization of children, that is very much a part of the culture in which we live. The Jeffrey Epstein drama seems to continue in our media, but I assure you, as uncomfortable as it is, it's just the tip of the iceberg. The awkward reality is we're in the midst of a culture which indulges in the sexual abuse of our children. For anyone willing to look, it's blatantly clear that the most powerful, wealthy, and often influential among us have been preying on our children. And if that isn't uncomfortable enough, 
The larger truth is that neither the justice system nor the media was willing to address the behavior. Beyond that, transgender surgeries on minors, hormone therapies, other life-altering procedures being performed on our children for profit. It was happening before 2020. I, I for one, didn't know it. I was woefully unaware. We've been watching locally, but it's not just locally. The struggle with libraries in our schools, in our cities, providing pornography to young children in our public schools, the determined effort to sexualize young children. And the discussion is, is so inappropriately framed. Someone said to me, I'm not an advocate for banning books. Baloney. Keeping pornographic books away from seven, eight, and nine years old is nine year olds is not about banning books. It's about acknowledging appropriate and inappropriate material. Yeah. We've got to be a little bit more aware. <laughs> then we've seen a lot of truth about the fragile condition of the church across our nation and beyond. It's been uncomfortable. It's been difficult, but the only way to get to a healthier place is to recognize our current condition. We've been reluctant to embrace biblical authority. We have waning influence, a culture that for, for generation upon generation upon generation has been held together in spite of being a nation of immigrants coming from the countries of the world. What bound us together was a commonality of our faith and our worldview. That influence has been significantly diminished to the point that the church to a frightening extent, is unwilling to speak regarding biblical morality. It's almost as if we've locked arms and trying to avoid our responsibility to be salt and light. We have to change. Then we have witnessed since 2020, or at least to me, it's, it's come into the light. It's been made clear the unprecedented politicalization of our military, our law enforcement, and our justice system. We've seen the intentional betrayal of our citizens and our national sovereignty. They've opened our borders without apology. They look in the camera, the people responsible, and say, our borders are secure. We've been witnesses to globalist agendas that are prioritized over the needs of our citizens. You don't have to be particularly sophisticated on an international level to get this. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars to secure the borders of Ukraine, and we won't secure our own. We're watching competitive advantages be given to factions within China while we put our own citizens at disadvantage. The list goes on and on. It's uncomfortable. It's not always necessarily something to be celebrated, but it is a celebration that what was being hid in the, hidden in the darkness has been brought to the light. We can address it. We can respond to it. We can begin to pray about it. We can say we don't intend for it to continue on our watch. And as difficult as it may be, we will respond. Only God could have brought it to the light. I never thought I would thank God for a pandemic, but it seems that in the midst of all the threat that that brought and the suffering that it brought, God began to move in a new way. I've never seen on a consistent basis so many people hungry for the things of God as we see today. It's time for God's people to buy the truth and not sell it. Let's be candid for just a moment. We have sold the truth for other opportunities. We have. And now we'll have to find the courage to buy the truth. And I think the ultimate motivation is to do so for the generations who are following. Let's talk a minute about the courage it will take to serve the Lord, because it will take courage. You see, we, we've had this shallow gospel presented to us that the great dis display of courage in your faith is when you'd walk the aisle of a church and say, I need Jesus. And, and that takes a, a modicum of courage. I, I won't deny that. But to imagine that's the greatest expression of courage that will ever be attached to your faith is grossly misleading. That's our entry point, and when you're standing on the outside of something, that first step is always more difficult. This is your first visit to church. That's a scary place. We're glad you're here. I hope we're not as scary as you heard. 
but the service is young, so we'll try to live up to our reputation. <laughs> and I understand that those first steps towards the Lord can be frightening, because there's a battle that takes place within all of us. And we're concerned about what might be required of us, or what we might have to forfeit, or what limits it will bring. But growing up in the Lord takes courage. Serving the Lord takes courage. I brought you a rather well-known passage. I, I thought it was easier to, to illustrate the principle with something that was familiar. It's the commissioning of Isaiah, one of the greatest of the Hebrew prophets. And he gives us a historical context. It's Isaiah 6. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The book of Revelation it's not the only place in the Bible where we get scenes of the throne room of God. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. Can you imagine? And above him were seraphs, and each with six wings. Two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah, understandably, is intimidated. He said, I cried, woe to me, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. That's worse than your first visit to church. Isaiah says, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? And then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which we'd, he'd taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me. Amen. Wow. We read that like it's normal. Suppose this is your first visit to our church. And I said, listen, we need somebody to work in the nursery. How many of you think if it's your first visit, you jump up and say, here I am. <laughs> Not a chance you'd be sitting there going, Pooh, I'm glad I'm a visitor. <laughs> Going here with all those ankle biters. Not a chance. Let somebody else go. I raised mine, let somebody. <laughs> I mean, we read that like it makes perfect sense, like there's a logic flow in there, but there, there's something being expressed from Isaiah, and it's given to us, I believe, to help us imagine. You see, that with an appropriate revelation of God, remember what we talked about, that if we'll buy the truth, it'll bring understanding to us. All of a sudden, Isaiah has understanding he had not had previously. And his response was, absolutely, here I am. Folks, we need truth that will bring understanding that will result in activity. We've had our Bible studies. We've had our covered dish dinners. We've had our fellowship meetings. And I'm not opposed to any of the above. But I'm telling you, there's an activity that is going to be needed from the church in order for us to see the name of Jesus exalted and our schools changed and the truth be celebrated again in the public square. The pattern we have had has not been adequate. Can we have the courage to tell that truth? So I want us to hear Isaiah saying, here I am. Now for complete candor, not everybody in the Bible raises their hand quite that easily. There is frequently some reluctance by some of our greatest biblical heroes. They said, no, I'm good, thanks. I'll take a pass, send somebody else. And again, I chose familiar stories because I think the principle is more important than introducing you to another one of the characters. We'll do that in some of the weeks ahead. Moses, the greatest leader we have in the Bible, really, until we meet Jesus. Unprecedented. In Exodus chapter 3, God is recruiting Moses. You know, we all want to think if God recruited us, we'd go, well, yeah. Let's go. I'm in. We want to think that. Well, if I knew it was God, you know, I kind of had a thought. I had a premonition. Felt like maybe. 
But if I had really known, I would have said no more softly. Well, God's recruiting Moses in Exodus 3, and it says, God said, the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. I mean, Moses killed the man for that objective. I mean, he forfeited his entire inheritance. So that's really good news to him. But God said, I'm sending you. You would think he would go, yes, now I'm going back with some real authority. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Don't get lost in the biblical language. Moses said, I'll take a pass, thank you. Chapter 4, verse 1, this is a rather lengthy dialogue. Moses answered the Lord. God's trying to tell him why he can do it. And Moses answered the Lord, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? Or what if they say the Lord didn't appear to you? Guess what they did? They didn't believe him. Frequently, they wouldn't listen to him. At multiple occasions, they would say, does God only talk to you? I'm wondering if Moses ever reminded God of this in this original conversation. <laughs> Same chapter, verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, Lord, I've never been eloquent not in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, he really doesn't want to go. God keeps showing him his provision. He gives him a staff that has some really unique, you know, if you knew the code to unlock all the tricks on that staff, it was amazing. And Moses said, you know, really, that will be great for parties. I can meet some new people. But if it's all the same with you, I'm good in the desert. And God said, no, you got to go. And he said, yeah, but I don't, even, I don't talk so good. Verse 12, now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. The heaven, the creator of heaven and earth said, listen, I'll write your script. I will put it in the prompter. And Moses said, please send someone else to do it. <laughs> I've prayed that prayer. Haven't you? you ever recognized an opportunity? Some kind of God opportunity, some kingdom opportunity, an opportunity to be kind or good or generous. And you kind of thought, sort of thought, yeah, maybe there was a window there. I could have slipped in there. And I'm like, no, God, let somebody else do it. And the Lord's anger burned against Moses. He said, well, what about your brother, Aaron? I know he can speak well. <laughs> He's already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. Moses took the assignment, but he took it reluctantly. I say that to you because in, in all candor, almost every significant juncture in my life, when I have said yes to the Lord in a new way, I have done it with significant reluctance. either because I, I really didn't like the direction. Often I felt very underprepared or that I lacked the basic competencies to accomplish whatever it was. Most typically, it just didn't suit what I wanted to do. I understood for a while before I ever said yes to the Lord that he was inviting me towards ministry. But I didn't want to be a minister. I had a different plan. It was focused on things that I liked to do and a lifestyle that I, I wanted to see if I could put together. And I had invested significant time and energy and effort and resources in pursuing what I wanted to do. And I had this nagging sense. There wasn't anything shouting at me. I didn't have, you know, visions with neon lights. And I just, there was this persistent, and I, I thought, Ah. And that there was one component that, that, that's, that's valuable. Perhaps it would help some of you. I was locked in a struggle to get in my way. I know you've never done that, but pray for me because sometimes I get into that place. And I was locked in this struggle to get what I wanted. And 
it was in a, a program where there was a lot of attrition, and so it got really personal to me. And I watched people, in my opinion, misbehave. In order to, to create the, the rate of attrition they needed, they would do things to discourage people and to, to get people to drop out, and I hated them for it. I hated them for it. And I'm competitive enough that if I think you're not playing fair and you're mistreating people, I might not make it over the top, but I'll give it, and I, I wouldn't have quit. I would have been in that profession today if God hadn't intervened. He put somebody in my life through some circumstances that I didn't arrange, and it involved an ice storm, so I couldn't get away. <laughs> and it was somebody that I respected enough that when they would ask me a question, I would give them an honest answer. And they began to ask me about what I was doing and where I was headed, and I, I said, and they listened for the most of the day, and they finally said, you know, you are filled with bitterness and resentment. And you need to be willing to get rid of that. And I thought, well, you know, that's really my fuel. I can study through the night or get up early for what I need to do or I can push through because that gives me a little edge. Nice people will quit. Mean, nasty, resentful people won't. And they cared enough about me that they said, you'll, you'll never make an argument that will cause God to agree with you when you're wrong. And they asked me if I was willing to forgive. And I said, I would. And they walked me through a little exercise. Simply saying, I forgive and acknowledging my own need to be forgiven. And releasing those people that I, I had been so frustrated with that I thought were unfair and unjust. You see, the injustice in somebody else does not give you the right to be filled with anger and resentment and bitterness and hate. It doesn't. And I forgave those people. And I finished that little prayer time with my friend and we got done and they said, may I pray for you? And I said, sure. They prayed for me when they got done. They said, have you ever thought about the ministry? I said, never. <laughs> and I was being, I had not, I oh, never thought about that. You know, at that point in my life, the ministers I knew were long black robes and vestments. You know what I'm talking about? I don't, I didn't ever remember seeing a minister smile. And I thought, Lord, if I got the job, they'd fire me day three. <laughs> and I knew I wouldn't make it to the second weekend. And I, I was a reluctant recruit. But God brought the voice I needed so that I could get the spiritual freedom so that I could buy the truth I needed for what was next. And he'll do that for you. I want you to understand that saying yes to the Lord, it's not always a life-changing career or... But oftentimes, we're reluctant. You know, in the last few years, several years ago now, really, we, were, we are an independent, interdenominational church in the center of what has been the epicenter of the Southern Baptist and the Church of Christ. That's a collision course. And if, if you're the, like the lone voice in that, it's a collision course where you're going to be identified as a heretic particularly if you start in a tent. I mean, you don't, it doesn't take much imagination to begin to attach things to that. And so a few years ago, somebody said, well, why don't we put our Sunday morning service on channel two? It'd be like pulling the curtain back on church. And people could see that we don't handle snakes or <laughs> drink Kool-Aid or, you know, whatever. I thought, well, you know... And that means we're a TV preacher. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think we really want to do that. <laughs> you know, it's one thing if you get in your car and you drive to church, and you walk in the building, I feel the freedom to kind of, you, you raised your hand and said, I want to be here. I feel free to tell you the truth. But if I show up in your house because you're looking for the ball game, and I say, I believe Jesus of Nazareth is the incarnate son of God and that he 
healed the sick and raised the dead, and he's coming back to the earth, and you need to know him or you won't be ready. Or that I believe demons are real, they're praying for the sick, or speaking in tongues. I don't know. Do I have to say that outside the building? And so we took that little step, and I, I did it begrudgingly, reluctantly, hesitantly, didn't tell anybody. And I watched what the, you know, the Lord kept putting those invitations, and I, I thought, Lord, I don't. I mean, have you ever watched TV preachers? <laughs> I know you have, because every time I say that to a group of people, they chuckle just like you do. <laughs> and you know the assumptions that are made. I was reluctant again, but I, I wasn't so reluctant that I ultimately wasn't willing to say, Lord, whatever you ask me to do, I'll tell the truth wherever you give me the opportunity to whomever you give me the opportunity. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be honest enough with you to understand that I'm not just pointing at biblical characters. And I understand that for you to say yes to the Lord and his invitations in your life will not always be, be fun. If, if you think they're fun, you're not paying attention to all the right ones. I'll give you another example. Again, I think you know the story. Gideon, he's one of the judges. This is before there's a monarchy, before there are kings in Israel. And there's a national threat. There's a threat to the well-being of the 12 tribes, which means that they're greatly outnumbered. The enemy is overwhelming. They have been just decimating the, the economy of the tribes. And God needs somebody that can lead a defense of the people. And so he recruits this character by the name of Gideon. And it says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak and watched Oprah. <laughs> well, that's kind of what it says. But... <laughs> Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep him from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Wow, I'm thinking that's pretty good. How many of the angels in heaven and said, you know, where we come from, you're a mighty warrior. And yeah, well, you know, I've felt that way myself quite often. But Gideon said, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? He's not at an emotional peak. He's in a very, very difficult place. In fact, he's hiding to thresh enough wheat for his family. Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and he's put us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon's in a very difficult place. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Gideon said, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. My clan's the weakest in my tribe, and I'm the least in my family. If he was in the south, he just said, I'm the runt of the litter. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you'll strike down all the Midianites together. Now, some of you know Gideon's story. He didn't relent just yet. He continued to put some questions before the Lord. He's a reluctant recruit. I understand the reluctance. We have routines and lives and plans and dreams and aspirations, and we're aware enough to understand that God might rewrite the story. He might ask you to give birth to something. He might ask you to accept responsibility for something, to redirect time or energy or effort or to raise your voice or to raise your head up or to raise your hand. I would submit to you that God is searching the earth. He still is. Just as he was for Moses or Gideon, just as he recruited Isaiah, that the Spirit of the Lord is still searching the earth for men and women who are willing to prepare themselves to buy the truth and not sell it, to engage in the discipline that's necessary, to be the people of God in their generation. The Bible's very clear. There are times and generations when people were not willing to do that. May it not be said of our generation. 
Should we talk about renewals and revivals and awakenings as if, as if it's something that happens apart from us, away from us? Completely, you know, with it's just a sovereign something. And I agree, only God can change a human heart. Or we're, we're talking about outcomes that God has to engage, but God works in the earth through his people. Amen. And it may be that you committed yourself to prayer with a discipline and a, and, a, and a determination and a quiet that opened the doors for the Spirit of God to move in ways that would change the course of a nation. See, I don't think it's, we're called, it's necessary that we're called to do things that are perceived as significant by the world. I think we're asked to be faithful, and then God brings about significant outcomes. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, it's another familiar story. David, he's a shepherd boy. By all probabilities, he's still a teenager, probably a young one. He's not old enough to be in the Israelite army, but there's a challenge, and his older brothers have gone and served in the army, and David was sent by his father just to check on his brothers and take him some food. He's not old enough to count. So he's sent with food for his brothers, the warriors. And the entire Israelite army is frightened and intimidated and threatened. They're unwilling to respond to the invitation of Goliath. You, you know the story. You learned about it if you've been in church since childhood. And David hears Goliath bellow his challenge. Goliath means warrior, mighty warrior. He hears this mighty Philistine warrior bellow his challenge, and the entire Israelite army hides in fear. And David said, oh, I could do this. I could do this. And they're in such bad condition because for 40 days, morning and evening, they've been being taunted that they're going to consider letting a teenager fight the battle that they're unwilling to fight. That's pretty messed up. They're there to protect the young people of the nation, and they're going to push one out onto the field of battle to do something they're all afraid to do. It's David's commentary that I think is helpful. He said, your servant, the king calls him in, and he said, the king, Saul, who stands head and shoulders above everybody else, he's the physical specimen you'd be expecting to go take on Goliath. No, he's not interested. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. David understood something. It wasn't the armies of Saul that were being challenged. It's the armies of God. And the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Just real, David was prepared. His preparation had come when he had a job that nobody else wanted. The shepherds were the lowest rung on the social ladder. That's why they got the invitation to that birth party in Bethlehem. So David's had the job that nobody wanted. He wasn't good enough or strong enough or old enough or mature enough to go with his brothers. You could take him some food to eat. But while he was doing that job that everybody overlooked, he's preparing himself. He's facing the challenges that come to him in that place. Don't, be, don't begrudge the challenges that come to you. Don't be overcome with anger or resentment or bitterness. It's easily done. But choose not to do it. And if you have, repent, forgive, and release. It will change the trajectory of your life. So that David's prepared. He said, yeah, he's big and he is ugly. And his spear is intimidating. But a lion's intimidating and a bear's intimidating. And God delivered them into my hand. And I, I know God and he'll deliver him into my hand. What amazes me at the end of that little passage we read is that Saul is unwilling to accompany him. I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, well, at least Saul would say, listen, we'll do it together. No, no, he said, God be with you. God be with you. I've learned some other things along the way. When you begin to cautiously and hesitantly and awkwardly begin to say yes to the Lord, there's some people you think will go with you. And on a lot of occasions, they'll say, you know, Lord bless you. I don't feel called to that. The Lord called you. I'm sure glad God called you to that. 
change the trajectory of David's life. So what can we do? Well, I want to say that a little differently. I want to close with what we can do. We're not powerless. We're not victims. We're not without resources. We're not without hope. Hebrews chapter 12. Remember our title? Let's choose truth. Let us choose the truth. Well, Hebrews 12 is going to add to that. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the, this is our time in the arena floor. This is our opportunity to be engaged under the sun. But we're surrounded by all of those who have been engaged before us, Isaiah and Moses and Gideon and David and the whole list. This is in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 11 is listing many of those people. And it says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Amen. Yes. We're being called to some things. Personal faith, a personal choice, personal preparation, and then the corporate collective expression of that. Let us, it doesn't say let me, or you, forgive me, in the South, it's saying y'all. <laughs> Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that can easily entangle us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Some of you are runners. If you don't know, the rest of us don't like you. You remind us of our woeful inadequacies. <laughs> Your 7,000 days of consecutive running. You have run when you had double pneumonia. And the temperature was below zero. And you put on a weighted vest. <laughs> we forgive you. But we're being asked to run with perseverance. What those individuals have is a commitment of perseverance that the rest of us haven't cultivated. Oh, we explain it in terms of their metabolism or their genetics. Or, but the truth is they have embraced a discipline that we haven't. And we're being asked to cultivate a discipline by the truth. With it comes some things. Wisdom and discipline and understanding. So this year, we're going to read. Let's read a little bit. We're going to pray. Let's pray a little bit. We're going to share our faith. Let's talk a little bit. But we're also going to throw off everything that hinders. Amen. And we're going to begin to run with a new kind of perseverance. And we'll just see what God will do. Amen. After all, he initiated this way back in 2020. He began to turn the lights on. There were things in the room that we didn't know were here. And God's began to make them clear to us. And if he's made them clear to us, I believe he intends to see them changed. Amen. And he's recruiting. Let's raise our hands. I brought you a prayer. Why don't you stand with me? It's really a proclamation. It's a little longer than most of the prayers I would bring you. But let's make it together. It's a declaration really of hope and encouragement. But even though God has begun to, to let us see the truth, we don't have to shrink back in fear or anxiety or frustration. Are you ready? I put on the garment of praise and hope. I choose the joy of the Lord as my strength. I lay aside the spirit of heaviness and raise my voice in praise of the living God. May my eyes be open to the provision of God and my ears attentive to the sound of his deliverance. Holy Spirit, help me. In you I find power and revelation. God has restored my broken heart and set my feet on a path of victory. I have hope for today and the strength to complete the course you have chosen for me. Let the people of God arise triumphant, and may the name of Jesus be lifted up throughout the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.